Thank you so much, uh, Paulette and Arjun, uh, that wonderful welcome and introduction. And I'm so happy to be here um, at the annual band folks vigil. And I'm so happy that you're here as well. Um, my name is Jody Jameson. Uh, I'm the nursing librarian at the University of Oswego Libraries based on the at the Mulford Library and the Health Science Campus. And uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you the curious story of Marjorie Kent, uh, a voice released from the cupboard. Um, Marjorie Kent is a, was a fascinating woman from medieval England, and she was the authoress of the earliest autobiography written in the English language. Although the, the book of Marjorie Kent that she wrote has never been formally banned per se in modern times, uh, its curious history, provenance, and authorship certainly provide insight into issues surrounding censorship, the silencing of women's voices, as well as intellectual freedom within the context of uh, the late medieval period and early uh, modern Europe and England. And, and these are all issues that are really at the heart of the banned books vigil today. Our story, the context of my presentation, begins here at Southgate House near Chesterfield, England, in the county of Derbyshire in the summer of 1934. Great photo here from the 1930s. On a leisurely day, the Butler Bowden family, who occupied this bucolic home in the pleasant English countryside, were playing a game of ping pong with their friends. After a ping pong ball was stepped on and crushed, extra ping pong balls were needed, obviously, to keep the game going. So the party of ping pong players decided to look inside a cupboard in the game room. Much to the party's surprise, within the cupboard was a collection of old medieval manuscripts, including, lo and behold, the sole surviving a uh, full-length 15th century manuscript of the Book of Marjorie Kent. Wonderful story in terms of how that manuscript was discovered. And if you know anything about Marjorie Kent, but as I talk about her, the way that her manuscript was found is just very fitting to her whole life story and character. Up to this point, the extent of the public's knowledge of Marjorie Kent was contained within very brief abstracted pamphlets describing incredibly very minimal details of her life and work. So finally, after several hundred years, the voice of Marjorie Kent had been released unto the world from a cupboard in the house in the English countryside. So here are some images of the surviving manuscript of the book of Marjorie Kent, now held in the British Library in London for all of us to see and for researchers to utilize in their scholarship and is, is thankfully well preserved. The red annotations that you see in the margins there were actually marked up by monks in a Carthusian friary in Yorkshire where the manuscript was held before it serendipitously found its way into Southgate House in Derbyshire. The surviving manuscript discovered at Southgate House is actually not the original manuscript, which is presumably lost. However, it is a copy made of the original manuscript and was created around 1440, shortly after uh, Marjorie Kemp's death. So what is it about the Book of Marjorie Kemp uh, that uh, makes it so significant and what makes it an autobiography and also and I'll talk a little bit later what is it that could be potentially controversial about it particularly in the late medieval period and early modern period in uh during the, the Protestant Reformation I'll talk about that in a little bit so the book itself is written in Middle English in a Norfolk dialect native to the area that Marjorie lived. She lived uh, in a town called Bishop's Lynn uh, in England in Norfolk. Here is a direct quote from the book there in Middle English. I cannot do that great Middle English accent that so many of my former English professors could do, 
but you can read this here. This is a description of, uh, of in Marjorie's voice of what her book is all about. Uh, the book describes Marjorie's feelings and revelations and the form of her living. It is really best described, I would say, as a spiritual autobiography de detailing Marjorie's growth as an individual uh, in her devotion to God. It includes very vivid descriptions of her visions, meditations, and mystical revelations. In addition, it's an equally vivid portrayal of daily medieval life. This is probably one of the reasons that the book is just so significant. It provides a uh, first-hand account of the sights, smells, scenes, and sounds of England in the late medieval period that you can't really get from too many other sources. Equally significant is that it's from the perspective of a middle-class woman, again, a, a rare voice that we don't really have um, from, from that period. In her book, Marjorie does not use the first person that she talks about herself. Instead, she refers to herself as this creature, or the creature. Um, so who was this creature named Marjorie Kemp? She was born around 1373, and she died sometime after 1439, it's estimated. She hailed from the bustling port town of Bishop's Lynn in Norfolk, which is now present-day King's Lynn. Uh, and much of the medieval architecture that Marjorie would have been surrounded by and known has been preserved is captured in these wonderful images there. You see the guild hall and some buildings there, as well as the, the church. She was the daughter of John Burnham, a successful merchant, and his wife Isabella. She married John Kemp, and she bore 14 children. Whether or not all of those children survived, we're not sure, but that is amazing that Marjorie alone survived the birth of 14 children, especially in this time period. So from that alone, we know she's a very strong, very strong woman. Prior to her spiritual awakening, Marjorie lived a very materialistic lifestyle that she describes in detail in the book. She talks a lot about her shortcomings. She was very covetous of the latest fashions and styles and envious of others who had more than her. She was a businesswoman. She tried her hand at grueling and Millie, very resourceful woman. After experiencing her first visions, which occurred after the birth of one of her children, uh, she describes a period where um, in modern terms, when we look back on it, it looks like she suffered from some form of very severe postpartum depression or psychosis. And after she got better and recovered, she had a vision of Jesus at her bedside. And it was in that moment that she um, devoted herself to, to her faith. Uh, after experiencing her first visions, she became a pilgrim. She traveled extensively throughout the Middle East, Europe, and England to visit various religious sites on a number of different sojourns and travels. She traveled extensively. As a spiritual seeker and mystic, Marjorie was often emotionally overcome by her visions of Jesus, resulting in extensive bouts of weeping and wailing in public settings, and much to the chagrin and annoyance of some of her onlookers. <laughs> um, later in life, she became a caregiver to her elderly husband, who suffered what was most likely a traumatic brain injury on her fall down the stairs. And she describes that he became very childlike, and she had to clean up after him and take care of him, and the challenges of this, this caregiver burden that she had to endure. So she's just so human. You read her autobiography, and she's just such a, a relatable, uh, very relatable lady, really fascinating. And of course, Marjorie was an author. However, the authorship of her book is quite complicated. And this is where it gets interesting. So it's uncertain whether Marjorie herself could read or write as a middle class woman in the medieval period. She would not have been as educated as women of the more noble classes, of course. However, she would have been exposed to the oral tradition of being read aloud, too. And as a woman from the middle class, she would have certainly seen books and manuscripts, perhaps owned some. And in her autobiography, she does describe all these some devotional texts and books. So it's presumed by scholars that Marjorie was not completely illiterate, but perhaps her skills were lacking enough that she couldn't read or write 
at the level that was required to physically write the book herself. Therefore, Marjorie actually dictated her story to amanuenses or scribes. And amanuenses is, is a Latin word that comes from of the hand. One of these was a priest, and, a, and another is speculated to have been uh, her, her son, one of her sons. So, as stated before, it was composed in the third person, written in a Middle English uh, Norfolk dialect. Um, later, a monk named Richard Saltos of Norwich. He has been identified as, as the scribe of the sole surviving manuscript that was discovered at Southgate House in 1934. He copied it from the now lost original manuscript and his signature, you can see there a photo of it at the end of, of that manuscript saying, thanks be to Jesus as Santos. So uh, he's the scribe himself. He is thankful for, for having this manuscript. Uh, so it's a nice little touching, touching note there. But this really begs the question of whether Marjorie was able to read her manuscript herself once it was cut, completed, and written down. Was she able to proofread it? Surely it would have hopefully been read aloud to her for any final proofing or approval. And you do get some insight into that uh, when you're reading for autobiography. But how much of the voice in the book is, book is Marjorie's, and how much of it is told through the lens of the male scribes? These are questions contemporary scholars have grappled with, yet it is abundantly that Marjorie's unique persona still does shine through. But that unique persona that leaps out of the pages of the full manuscript may have been a bit too much for early modern society. So years after Marjorie's death in 1501 and 1521, the manuscript was redacted to less than 10 pages in the form of printed pamphlets that were made to distribute en masse to the public. Of course, this served a practical purpose in the early days of printing and saved ink and paper from having to print approximately 200 pages or so of the manuscript. So definitely understandable there. Yet, it should be noted that these pamphlets contain little, if nothing, of Marjorie's character uh, and biography and instead are completely rewritten and reframed as very orthodox devotional texts. So it appears that the public was meant to use these pamphlets for the purpose of contemplation, reflection, prayer, and meditation. So this is a great quote from the British Library, which I'll read a full that I think sheds a lot of good insight into uh, the, the issues surrounding these early modern redacted versions of Marjorie's stories. So within these pamphlets, the, the person of Marjorie has been quietly obscured and the text has been reframed. Where in the manuscript, the full manuscript version, Marjorie is a larger than life character who roars and wails and boisterously communicates her devotion. In Packwell's printed edition, she's a listener and not a speaker. She's more submissive, subservient. In this way, the work is a metaphor for the way in which women's experiences have so often been cut down, reframed, and controlled by men throughout history. Okay. The first of these pamphlets that was printed was, was done by Lincoln DeWert, a German immigrant to England who was an assistant to William Caxton and Caxton's successor. Caxton uh, being the, the individual who brought the printing press to England. Uh, it was entitled A Short Treatise of Contemplation. There's a Lincoln DeWert's printer's mark there. Uh, what is significant though about this is that Marjorie's work, even though it was redact redacted in this pamphlet, it played a role in the very early days of the printing industry in London. It was one of the first things to be printed in a mass, which I find to be quite incredible. The second of these pamphlets was a reprinting of DeWord's uh, short treatise uh, done by Henry Petwell in 1521. And you see the images there. These are held also in the British Library. Scant copies of these pamphlets exist. Once Protestant Reformation took place in England around the 1530s into the early 1600s, devotional Catholic works such as these would have been destroyed uh, by the Protestant reformers. Public any publications about the old religion were targeted and just deliberately destroyed, burned, uh, etc. So uh, Marjorie Kemp scholar Anthony Bale has called this a type of 16th century publishing censorship. 
It really is a miracle that the sole existing manuscript of Marjorie's book survived the dissolution of the monasteries. That alone is amazing. It was held at the Mount Grace Priory in Yorkshire around the 1510s, and then it was possibly held at the London Charter House in the 1530s. How the manuscript found its way to Southgate House is largely unknown. Uh, and it remains largely in the words of Anthony Vale, a story of chance, disorder, and layered histories. But it really is a miracle. Uh, the manuscript itself gives us a lot of insight into Marjorie's divisive character and how she herself encountered toxic behavior from others during her uh, lifetime. She is accused often throughout her story as being a heretic or a lollard, as they were known in Marjorie's day. Some instances of the text also seem to veil or underplay some of Marjorie's teachings. And because as a woman, this was, you know, she was treading on thin water there, especially in this time period. So those veiling and underplaying tones were kind of meant to keep her teachings within the orthodoxy of the medieval period and to keep her safe. Throughout her travels throughout England and really anywhere she went in Europe, the Middle East, she encounters many men in the church who question and interrogate her and try to correct her. I call this medieval mansplaining. One of these was the very powerful Archbishop of York who held her for several days and interrogated her. Uh, in all of these instances, though, Marjorie narrowly escapes with her life. Um, we have to remember, too, that these were very trepidatious times. Joan of Arc was burned at the stake in 1431, a few years before Marjorie's death. Also, on Marjorie's travels and pilgrimages, she was often bullied and harassed by other pilgrims on her travels. They make fun of her for crying and wailing when she has her visions of Jesus and when she uh, visits religious sites and is overcome just by the emotional nature of it. They alienate her at meals, and this always sort of reminds me when I read her book of, you know, the mean girls at the lunch table. No, you can't sit here with us. That's how they treat her. Um, they also tear off her clothes and shred them, so she has nothing to wear. Um, and Marjorie talks about the, this bullying behavior in her book, and it makes me wonder if she's, she's doing that to call attention to the hypocrisy of some of the so-called Christian believers here. So it's very interesting. But again, she's just such a human force, and these details provide uh, rich insight into her inner experience, her inner emotional life as a woman and as an individual, a unique, very eccentric individual. The Book of March weekend is unique in that it explores a variety of different themes, which I'll outline here. So mental illness. Uh, in the first chapter of the book, Marjorie describes, as I said earlier, uh, suffering from what appears to be postpartum depression or psychosis after the birth of a child. It's very, very severe. She suffers with this for uh, around a year. It's after this, uh, when she recovers, that her spiritual journey begins. So it's really amazing, you know, out of suffering, um, Marjorie recovers and has a new lease on life. I think that's something that we can all relate to in some form today, different challenges, trauma, or experiences that we've gone through. It also explored materialism, vanity, and envy. Marjorie is very honest that prior to her spiritual conversion, she had a lot of shortcomings. She had a lot of fashion and wearing, uh, you know, fancy head dresses and, and gold and uh, elaborate, colorful fabrics. Uh, she also describes being very attached to money, uh, and she pursues a career in brewing, which actually was a common career that women could go into in the Middle Ages. She did this along with her husband, John Kemp, and she also operated grain mill for a short period of time. Uh, it also explores domesticity, family life, and issues relating to marriage and compromise in, in a marital relationship. So Marjorie and husband John have a unique relationship it's described in the book. As she embarks on her spiritual journey, she requests that she and her husband maintain a celibate relationship so that she can 
devote and, and live her life as a devoted woman to God. At first, her husband is a little put off by this, but he agrees to it, and they live together um, until his death, sort of presumably as friends and companions. It's really, really touching. So they appear to have a very strong bond and a deep attachment. He supports her in all of her endeavors, including her travels and her pilgrimages. Um, and she also supports him when he has his fall down the stairs and suffers from the brain injury and becomes very childlike. She cleans up after him and, and takes care of him. So it's very touching. It also, of course, gives us a lot of insight to her personal relationship with God and finding her own uh, spiritual purpose throughout life. So there is a lot in the book detailing um, her visions and her revelations and her view of, of God in her life and also God's role in, in the world and in the universe. It also explores travel and independence. Marjorie was a great traveler, and as somebody who loves to travel, I give major props to, to Marjorie. She embarks on a lot of solo trips um, on her own as a medieval woman. Of course, then she joins up with different um, pilgrimages and different tour groups, um, but largely she, she does this all on her own. Her husband does not accompany her. Uh, so in the middle, medieval period, this is really amazing. Uh, and it's really still even impressive by today's standards, the amount of travel that she did, uh, even into her, her older age. She makes pilgrimages to Jerusalem, Palestine, Bethlehem, Jaffa, Assisi, Rome, Santiago de Compostela. She also travels throughout England and Europe, including Norway and Germany. So Marjorie definitely uh, has that, I, I think, wanderlust, a curiosity about the world, uh, which, which I definitely relate to. It also explores issues surrounding the patriarchy and fighting the patriarchy. So when Mar Marjorie is interrogated by medieval churchmen, she stands up to them in her own way. She doesn't hold back. She's a, she's a strong, very feisty, outspoken woman. Another wonderful theme within the book is women supporting women. Everywhere that Marjorie goes, women really take to her. Um, they invite her into their homes to share meals, provide her with lodging on her travels and sojourns and pilgrimages. She visits the anchoress St. Julian of Norwich and receives encouragement and advice from her in a very touching moment. Also, the book de definitely questions authority, you know, and that Relating back to that theme of fighting the patriarchy, every time Marjorie is interrogated by powerful men in the church, she holds her own and she asks them questions. And, and in some moments, you see them actually sort of pausing to think and, and rethink what they're telling her. So um, she is, uh, it, it has a, a real talent for debate and uh, rhetoric and is a wonderful teacher as well. Makes me wonder if Marjorie were alive today, what she would be doing. She would be doing quite a bit. So I'd like to share just some of my favorite quotes from the book of Marjorie Kemp uh, before I finish up today. And a lot of these quotes are not necessarily related to her religious visions, but I think they give us good insight into her kind of earthy nature as a, as a human being. Um, Marjorie's descriptions of her life are very different and her daily life. So this is a quote. Um, after Marjorie recovers from her illness with uh, postpartum, what appears to be postpartum depression, she is, gets her appetite back, and all that she wants are keys to the buttery to fetch food and drink. So, I mean, I think we can all relate to that. After we recover from an illness and we finally have our appetite back, all we want is to, you know, binge out on some comfort food, and that is what Marjorie is saying here. After she was studied in her wits and pleaded with her husband as soon as he came to her that she might have the keys to the buttery to fetch her food and drink. So I just sort of picture Marjorie getting her snacks, sitting down, enjoying them. It's just, it's such a, such a human moment. I love it. This is the scene where Marjorie um, uh, compromises with her husband over their relationship. When, when she approaches him that she wants to, to live a celibate life and devote her life to God. So they are coming back from York, and uh, I'll just read it here. It happened one Friday on Midsummer's Eve in very hot weather, and this creature was coming from York. 
carrying a bottle of beer in her hand and her husband a cake inside his shirt. So you just picture them, you know, traveling along. Marjorie's got her beer, her husband's got his cake. And she says, hey, honey, I want to devote my life to Jesus and I want to be celibate for the rest of our lives. So no, it's just this, it's so Marjorie. It's, it's just wonderful. <laughs> This is later in the book when her husband takes his fall and he becomes um, uh, very, very ill. Then she took her husband home with her and looked after him for years afterwards as long as he lived. She had a great deal of labor with him for in his last days he turned childish, childish and lost his reason. So you just feel a great sense of love and devotion there between them. These are some other quotes um, also toward the end of the book where Marjorie describes the, the writing of her book. When this book was first being written, the said preacher was mostly at home in her room with her writer and said fewer prayers in order to hasten the writing that she had a previous year. So I kind of picture her as like, you know, in Virginia Woolf's book, A, a Room of One's Own, you know, uh, being there in her room uh, along with her scribe for Emma Nuisance to really, you know, make sure that everything in this book gets written down, um, neglecting maybe some of her prayers and other duties so that the book could be written and her story could be told. Also, here's a quote too about Marjorie's sort of nervousness and anxiety about her story getting out there. Uh, she, uh, sometimes she was in such a great depression over her feelings when over many days she did not know how they might be understood in fear of deceits and illusion. So what she's saying here is that she's nervous, you know, about her story getting out there. Um, maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome here and anxiety surrounding her work getting into the public. <laughs> so again, it's very human. So as I wrap up, I would like to play just a brief clip from a video with Marjorie Kemp scholar, Anthony Bale, um, as he discusses Marjorie's relevance Today, I'm going to fast forward to a particular section in the video. Oh, we can, we can, uh, uh, right now, it's stuck. It's so cold, cold. Maybe you could uh, just sum it up for us. We said we're getting out so we have so many things. Yeah. If you have a chance, there's a series of these wonderful videos on YouTube by Anthony Bale, and he um, goes into great detail about his research in Marjorie and her relevance today. So these are easy enough to find on YouTube. Uh, you can view those clips there. Also, I would just like to give a little promotion here to the work of Anthony Bale. He's a wonderful uh, medieval scholar, and he published a modern translation of the book of Marjorie Kent which is wonderful, I uh, highly recommend it. He also published a biography recently of Marjorie Kemp called Marjorie Kemp, A Mixed Life. So if you want to learn more about Marjorie and continue to be inspired by her story, I invite you to check out those sources. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for sharing in my talk today. Um, and I look forward to some of the other lectures this morning. Thank you, everybody.